phone today because he has uh, he has to take a little trip up to the Capitol today. So we haven't had staff meeting for quite a while, but normally Carlos facilitates it, but he has asked me to facilitate this meeting and he's gonna listen in and he said he would be on mute, but uh, we'll, we'll see, he may chime in on occasion. That's just a guess on my part. Uh, <laughs> But I uh, wanted to start out by, we've had quite a few changes in the department since we had our last commission meeting and you guys may or may not be aware of all the changes. So I just wanted to share my screen for a minute. And you should be seeing a picture that shows our UDOT senior leadership team. Can you move to Jerry, please? What was that? Can you zoom it out and enlarge it a little bit so we can see the faces a little bit better? Is uh, it possible? Is that yes, better? better? Yes. Okay, so um, last time we met, we still had Jason Davis with us and everybody got to say their goodbyes to Jason and have to say that I miss having Jason around. It was really great working with him, but now, as you were aware, we have Lisa Wilson has taken over Jason's spot, and I am loving working with Lisa. Her laugh is so infectious that it, it is, it's very enjoyable to work with her. So anyway, I think that's, that will be a great team and looking forward to that. And um, so now with Lisa moving, that opened up the Region 2 Director spot, which I think we've got, let me scroll down here and you can see all the pictures. So Robert Stewart has now moved into the role of director of region two. So welcome, Robert. You were on here somewhere and I think your camera went off, but so this now makes another change. So Robert left open the director of operations. So you can now see that Troy Peterson is our new director of operations. So congratulations to Troy. Welcome to the senior leadership team. And then let me see, Lisa's going to jump in and correct me if I start to go off base here. But now that Troy is the director of operations, that left the director of the TOC open, which has been filled with Lisa Zundel. Okay. And then we have, for quite a while, we have had an opening as the deputy of Region 2. And we were kind of waiting until the dust settled on a bunch of moves. And we have now, we have Nathan Peterson. I think I saw Nathan join. Is Nathan yeah, Nathan I'm here. here? Yes. Nathan Peterson is now going to be the deputy at Region 2. Okay. So he was the program manager in Region 1. And so now we still have a series of cascading effects of all of that. But those are the changes that we have had in the department in the last, just in the last month, just a couple of things happening. So I just wanted to, to go back over that with you and, and make you aware of that. And this org chart is something that we have on our strategic direction. And if you guys want to access that, I can show you how to get there. Um, but we've been using this a lot with the legislature, having them know who's on our senior team and giving them uh, phone numbers and access information, so. Terry, what about the Shane? You wanna talk about the auditor? Shane also got promoted. Shane? Yon? Yes, and I believe, Shane, are you on here? No, uh, let me see. Yes, I don't see that we have Shane on here, but I'm, yeah, that might've been one I've lost track of. I can't remember if he was in place in when we talked in December or not. So yes, Shane Young as director of audit because Jimmy Holfelt's retired. Terry, do we have any shortcuts for the Rob, Robert, Rob um, <laughs> regions? Are we, are we using last names? Do they have nasty nicknames that we should know about? <laughs> I think whoever responds first when you yell Rob or Robert. R1, R2, R3. Well, and also interesting, R1, 2, 3, and 4, each one of our region directors, all their names all start with R. Yes, I noticed that as I was writing. 
So we may have to resolve that over time. If you've got some recommendations, we would be interested in taking the recommendations. Although I do want to be sensitive and would seek approval from the person you want to give a nickname to. Yeah, Rob White looks kind of uncomfortable with that, at least with me. <laughs> so. Just call him R1, R2, R3, R4. That's <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Congratulations, have, everybody. They're going to have numbers and not names. <laughs> RTD2, whatever they call them. Okay, and any questions? Or Lisa, did you want to add anything I might have missed or in the org chart discussion? No, I'll just add that you will be seeing a new face as the Region 1 Program Manager. He's not on here, but his name is Brett Slater. And so um, that's another new addition to the folks you'll be seeing. Okay. Okay. If there are no other questions about that, I think, Heather, can you bring up the agenda, please? Or was she ready to, Heather, were you ready to do that or? Or Ben, do you have it handy? Ben's probably got 30 tabs open right now and, and is kind of saying, don't screw me up on which tab I was gonna choose. I can bring it up if you wanna stop presenting, I can. Yep. I can show that if yep. you'd like. Right, so we have a, a fairly short agenda here. I think probably the biggest item is probably item number two, TIF programming considerations. And we have a couple of subtopics under that category that Ben's gonna lead us through. But our first item, our annual Open Public Meetings Act training. And Jim Palmer, I believe, is going to lead us through this discussion. There we go. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, now that I've figured out how to turn on the microphone, uh, now I have to figure out how to present. I've never done this before. I think I've done something. All I can see is my presentation. Not yet. You want me to pull it up, Jim, and and you can just you want, would that work for you if I just shared just based off the website stuff? That might work better. Let's jump right into Plan B since uh, I'm not coherent. Do I need to do something to give up the screen? Mine's no, spinning now like because I think I was trying to I was trying to do it. Now Heather's doing it, so I think hopefully we can get that going here. Okay. Well, we have that much up. It's the opening page that everyone has seen before, unless you were recently promoted or appointed. I think I just changed the date every day. Is that what it's going to look like? Should I just move forward? Heather, I think you're in the notes mode.
Heather, are you pulling it back up again? Great, I think that, that works. Jim, can you see where she is? Yeah, that's gonna work. We're, we're doing everything in ways that just allows us to get it to work anyway, right? Um, this uh, presentation comes at a very opportune time, I think, uh, given the events of the past 78 days. Uh, we have an open and public meetings act and the grandma act for public records because we uh, are self-governing. Our system of government is uh, one without a dictator. We don't have a monarch. We govern ourselves. We're a constitutional democracy and a pure democracy is impractical so we have representative democracy and we elect representatives and the representatives make our decisions for us and among the decisions they make is uh, uh, delegating a lot of their duties to public bodies to take care of the details of, of governance and so we have to come up with some way to allow the public to participate in their government. They must be able to participate and they must have access to their government. So that's why we have OPMA and GRAMA. Participation needs more than elected leaders and participation requires access. Next slide, please. That'll be gone soon once we're all electric, I think. Um, the status agencies exist to aid in the conduct because Carlos can't do everything himself, the governor can't do everything himself. We have to have public bodies to take care of the details. And you, you guys, political subdivisions must take their actions openly and conduct their deliberations openly. Now, those two statements, those two uh, talking points are actually the beginning of the Open and Public Meetings Act. Now, those are statements by the legislature of why we have the act. Next slide, please. A, a few definitions that we have to understand to uh, understand the act. A meeting is a majority of the public body that discusses or takes comments from the public about a matter over which the public body has jurisdiction or advisory power. And a public body is any administrative, advisory, executive, legislative body of the state or local government that is created by the Utah Constitution, statute, rule, ordinance, or resolution, consists of two or more persons, and is vested with authority to make decisions regarding the public business. Next slide, please. Recording, you make recordings of the meetings as required by the act. Recording is audio or audio and video record of the proceedings of the meeting that can be used to review the proceedings afterwards. A history, a record. Electronic meeting is a meeting that does not require all the participants or attendees to be in the same place during the meeting. Uh, it, it seems like it was uh, invented especially for our present circumstances. And 
something that uh, we're all very glad that is written into the act since it enables us to continue functioning. We can conduct electronic meetings over the telephone, a conference call, speaker phone, the good old days of uh, what I'm used to rather than all this technology. Now we have the computer stuff, Zoom, Google Hangouts, and I guess this is Google Meet that we're using. Uh, we have Microsoft Teams, is something we use a lot in the Attorney General's office since we're kind of special. We have to use all the Microsoft stuff. And the other software based technology like the EMS, which I don't even know what EMS is. Benefits, participants may be anywhere. Anywhere in the world. It sounds like some of you are in your car and one of you is at the capital, apparently. Next slide, please. I have to apologize for these crowded. I have a lot of crowded, uh, busy, extremely detailed slides. That for some reason, I felt they were necessary. It makes it easier than me just telling you about them. The electronic meetings that we have, we're allowed to have now, we can have without the, the need for an anchor location like uh, the old uh, statute required. We had to have an anchor location for people to participate. But in the fifth special session of the legislature last last year, the le legislature made changes and the changes allow us to do these things without a an anchor location. Uh, we must provide a means for the public to hear or view and hear the open meeting portions of the meeting. We must provide a means for members of the public to provide comments to the public body by electronic means. Uh, the chair of the public body must make a written determination that conducting the meeting with an anchor location, uh, without an anchor location presents a substantial, or with it, yeah. Conducting the meeting with an anchor location would present a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at our anchor location. I don't know if we even have a room big enough in the Rampton building to accommodate uh, all people that might be interested in the commission meetings if we have to provide uh, six feet of space so everyone can social distance. So, as these electronic meetings are necessary. The uh, written determination that uh, the uh, leader must make must state the facts upon which the determination is based and must be posted at the public meeting notice with the public meeting notice. The chair of the public body must read the written determination at the beginning of the meeting. The notice for the electronic public meeting must include information on how a member of the public may view and make comments at the meeting. The written determination expires in 30 days after the day on which the chair of the public body Makes the determination, so you have to publish this determination every time you have a public meeting. The public body must uh, I'll repeat the process at every electronic meeting uh, where no anchor location is provided. Next slide, please. All right, we've established that 
wherever we have a meeting of a public body that's going to be carrying out the public business, we have to have the meeting open and accessible to the public. But there are times when a public body is discussing matters and issues that we really should not discuss in the public. And these are sensitive issues. And they're laid out in the uh, act. We can close a, a portion of a public meeting Whenever we need to uh, discuss the character, professional competence, physical or mental health of an individual, uh, these seem fairly obvious to me. You wouldn't want to uh, discuss these kinds of matters in public. Uh, strategy related to collective bargaining uh, between a public body and a union, apparently. A strategy related to pending or reasonably imminent litigation. Uh, we did that, uh, I believe, last year with this body. Or it, may have, it was probably the year before. We had to discuss a settlement in litigation uh, involving eminent domain. Uh, we, uh, we can close if we're going to discuss strategy related to purchase or exchange or lease of property, including any form of water right or water share. Uh, we can close the meeting if we were going to, going to discuss the deployment of security personnel, devices, or systems. Uh, but, you know, the public does include convicted felons locked up in the prison system. Allegations of criminal conduct. Uh, we wouldn't want to discuss allegations when there's really no proof that an individual has committed a criminal act. Uh, once you ring the bell, it's hard to take it back. Uh, we can close a meeting to discuss business related to the receipt or review of ethics complaints. And finally, the evaluation of proposals and processes related to public procurement uh, for obvious reasons, I think. Next slide, please. A properly noticed meeting, meeting you have to have a meeting that uh, has properly published notice and uh, all of the necessary elements are in the notice of the meeting, the public notice, where the quorum president may be closed if two-thirds of the members present vote to close. So that two-thirds present doesn't mean you have to have two-thirds of the entire body, just two-thirds of those present. Closed portion must be recorded and you may take written notes. You don't have written minutes. Uh, the recording must be complete and edited from, unedited from beginning to end. The recordings and the minutes of the closed meeting shall include the date, time, and place of the meeting, the names of the members present and absent, the names of all others present except where the disclosure would infringe on the confidentiality necessary to fulfill the original purpose of closing the meeting. Next slide, please. The recording and minutes of the closed portion of a public meeting are protected uh, by uh, subsection 305 of the Grandma Act. A court order, of course, may require disclosure. Uh, so if you get a subpoena for the record of the closed portion of the act, we would have to turn that over to the court. Uh, if a meeting is closed exclusively for purposes of discussing the character, professional competence, or physical or mental health of an individual, or discussing the deployment of security personnel devices or systems, 
the person presiding shall sign a sworn statement, such as an affidavit, affirming that the sole purpose of closing the meeting was to discuss the aforementioned topic. So, next slide, please. All right, you have to provide the public notice of the public meeting. So you have to provide that notice a minimum of 24 hours prior to uh, the meeting time, which uh, I'm glad exists right now. I've always thought it was too short until this week. Uh, notice must include the meeting agenda, date, time, and place. If meetings are scheduled over a year in advance, as the Transportation Commission does, uh, you must give public notice at least once a year of the full annual meeting schedule. And uh, this notice is published on the state's public notice website. It's accessible by anyone who has access to the, to the interweb through their Google machine. And uh, you can plan for your public meetings that you want to attend. Uh, they must be uh, written notice posted at the principal office and at the public notice website, which I just described. We also have uh, notice boards in the atrium of the Rampton building for posting public notice, uh, which in which the public is not allowed now. So uh, we have to rely on the uh, uh, the public website, public notice website, which uh, I don't think people <laughs> go wandering through the atrium at Calvin Rampin looking for public notices anyway, but they might. At least one newspaper of general circulation. And uh, I think this has been replaced with the public notice website. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, remember having to publish notice in uh, a newspaper of general circulation like the Tribune or the, the D News. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Next slide, please. Emergency meetings. Unforeseen circumstances happen. Um, and when they do, we can call an emergency meeting. We must give public notice still of that meeting, but it must be the best notice practicable. My favorite legal word is practicable. I'm not sure what it means. Uh, probably have to look up some cases, but uh, I think it means do the best you can. So if you have reason, if you have cause for an emergency meeting, you hurry and put your notice and your agenda together and you get it posted on the state public notice website as soon as you can before that meeting. Notice must include the time and place of the emergency meeting and the topic to be considered. You must attempt to notify all the members of the public body. You want as many there as, as you can get. You need, a, uh, you need a quorum anyway. Majority of the members must approve the emergency meeting. So you're gonna have to the uh, chair of the meeting is going to have to poll the membership and uh, get their approval to hold the emergency meeting, uh, the, the approval of the majority. Next slide, please. Written minutes and recordings. Uh, written minutes and recordings are required, except for site visits and tours, like you would be taking at this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, if no vote or action is taken, if you are going to go out on a bus and look at a, a job site, uh, if you want to take a vote uh, of, of official action that involves official action, you can do that while you're all sitting on the bus or while you're all standing at the job site, but you must take minutes of that activity. You have to know, you have to note uh, who voted for what, uh, you know, some details. 
what the discussion was. Written minutes must include a uh, date, time, and place of the meeting. The common stuff. Yep. The names of the members present and absent. The substance of the matter proposed, discussed, or decided. A record by individual member to each vote taken of each vote taken. The name of each person who is not a member of the public body who provided testimony or comments. Uh, the substance of the testimony or comments provided, and any other information that any member requests be entered in the minutes uh, or recording. Uh, as, as members of the commission, you commissioners should remember that. If there's something that you think uh, occurred or was discussed during one of your public meetings, and you think it important enough to be read into the record, you can do that. You can and you should do that. Uh, and that's provided for in the act. Recordings of uh, open meetings must be a complete and unedited record. So if you're going to use a uh, video recording, like when we record these meetings, uh, they've got to be complete and unedited from beginning to end. Hey, Jim. Um, I just, I want to make sure that we cover this appropriately like we need to, but just wanting to do a little bit of a time check. Um, I think everybody can see that we're on page 12 of 41, um, and we do have some other items we need to cover on the agenda. I'm just wondering if there's a way we can um, maybe move along a little bit, or are we going to cover all 41 slides? Oh, I don't recall there being 41 slides. <laughs> Seems to me like there's 17, but keeping that in mind, I will go quickly. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Electronic meetings generally, uh, we've already covered that sufficiently. We don't need to go through that. So let's do the next slide. Workshops. A workshop or executive session. Um, I've been asked a question by a number of people, not just related to UDOT. Uh, if they can, if their public bodies can have workshops, and the workshop is, is a subcommittee, and you use subcommittees to encourage minutia, to do your research before the body makes a major decision. Sometimes you can't make the decision just on what's pre pre presented at the meeting. You need some in-depth research. You can, uh, you can have a subcommittee together to take care of that. An executive session, a meeting or a portion of the meeting in which the proceeds are secret, um, that would just be the closed session of uh, the close portion of a meeting. Next slide, please. Oh, this is weird. Uh, ad hoc committee, a special committee established for the particular purpose or a particular time. Uh, their particular purpose, they have to have a designated purpose. They're temporary, limited membership, fewer than a quarter. They may be used to study problems, so this could be another word for a workshop, an ad hoc committee. Make recommendations. The purpose is to make recommendations or report findings to the full body. They don't make final determinations, and they must not be used to circumvent the uh, Open and Public Meetings Act. Next slide, please. Enforcement. This is, the, I think, this is the second to last slide, Terry. Disruptors may be removed. Um, it doesn't say by what means. It's not, not by any means possible, but they may be removed. Final action taken on, at unlawful meetings are voidable by court. Uh, you can be taken to court. Somebody can file a petition with the district court to void an action taken at uh, what turns out to be an illegal meeting. So if you do make 
have a decision someone disagrees with and there isn't a quorum present or uh, they find some other reason that, that the uh, the court can decide that the meeting was illegal, they can void that. Uh, suits to avoid to void the final actions must be filed with 90 days. So they have a 90 day statute of limitations. The attorney general or the county attorneys enforce the act. The attorney general must notify uh, the public body of changes in the requirement annually. And part of what I just did, we, uh, informed you of changes that happened last year. Uh, persons denied a right may file suit to compel compliance or enjoin, uh, keep you from taking action that they don't like. And a court may reward reasonable attorney fees and court costs, which is very important to keep in mind because one of the most difficult parts of our legal system is uh, the expense of going to court. This takes that problem away. Uh, the court will award the attorney fees and we'll have to pay for that. Next slide, please. Criminal penalty. I believe this is the last one. A member of the public body who knowingly or intentionally violates or who knowingly or intentionally abets or advises a violation of any of the closed meeting provisions of this chapter is guilty of a class B misdemeanor. Conviction, if the attorney general or the county attorney can prove that you knowingly or intentionally violated the uh, act, you will be convicted. If you're convicted of the uh, act, it's a misdemeanor which is uh, punishable by six months in jail, a maximum of six months in jail, and a maximum of a thousand dollar fine. That would be per occurrence too. So if you violated the act numerous times and they were able to prove that in court, uh, you would be fined and sentenced. You could be fined and sentenced uh, for each individual offense. Uh, let's check the next slide and see where that takes us. Tada, that is, uh, that is the outline. I, apparently, <laughs> all, of, all of the materials that I gave Heather have been melted together. That's why it's 42 pages. So you begin with the uh, deck, uh, and then you have an outline. This is just for your reference. And then after the outline, there will be the full text of uh, the Open and Public Meetings Act itself. This is for your reference. Uh, I just think it's important that you have something quick that you can refer to and that you also have the comprehensive full text of the act itself. So you can look for the answers to your questions before you call. That's all I have. Uh, you can get to the important stuff now. Unless anybody has any questions, I will hang up and go back to my other stuff. I have a question, Terry, from Jim. Okay. Uh, and the keeping the records, you know, there audio or audio video and minutes, or there's uh, audio and minutes of the meeting. Is, should be a combination or separately can be substituted as a legal record keeping? You know, if the, the audio and video of these meetings, uh, those files are so huge. I'm thinking if you have an audio file, an audio recording of the meeting, that's sufficient. And you keep your minutes, you store those. I don't believe you should be storing uh, complete copies of the audio video recording. And what is the shelf line? What is the shelf line on those recordings as evidence? Excuse me, what is the what? What is the shelf life of the recording of those as evidence for the court hearings or public? 
That's a really good question. That you've asked me what the retention schedule is right. for those, and I think the retention schedule is probably permanent. Really? Uh, you you would keep them uh, close at hand there at the Brampton building or wherever our electronic stuff is stored for a period of maybe five or seven years, and then you could transfer them to the state archives for permanent storage, but uh, we, we can't destroy any of that. Okay. One more question, Jim, if you don't mind, please. Uh -huh. In other uh, board that I said a year ago, I walked in the restroom and three members of the board were discussing the items of the agenda. And I tried to politely say that is not kosher. Was I right? They're not supposed to be doing that because supposed to be in the open public discussion rather than among three themselves? Yeah, I think you were right. They should not be discussing that because your deliberation should be done in public. They were in the wrong, but I don't think that was a criminal offense. They were just, they were, they forgot what they were supposed to be doing and, and, uh, and had a discussion that they shouldn't have. Uh, when the when you're involved in something like that, uh, the proper remedy for that, I believe, is to when you get back in the meeting on the record, uh, read that into the record. Say we four were just in the restroom and we discussed X, Y, and Z. We didn't make any determinations. We just discussed it amongst ourselves. But make that a part, part of your record just because transparency is very important. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything any, else? Any other can questions I, for Jim? Can I get back into my sweat now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to thank you, Jim, for he is always there for us. You find um, occasionally we'll jump into the middle of a meeting and try to make sure we have the right point of order because we want to make sure we're documenting and running our meetings appropriately. And Jim is always a great um, resource for us, always there to answer our questions and make sure that we're doing this correctly. So it's important stuff. And I know it, it can get, sorry, Jim, but can get a little tedious, but it is important that we're running our meetings appropriately. So thank you, Jim. I admit that it's very tedious, believe me. but. <laughs> You know, <laughs> sometimes doing things the right way is hard. You know, we got to do the hard stuff too. Thank so you. thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next year at the same time, if not sooner. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Um, so the next item we have on the agenda. It's your favorite topic. It involves the word prioritization. And as we're starting to think forward to our programming workshops that typically are March and April, we're just trying to think about all the things that we need to have in place for that and thinking about TIF. Last year, we were getting prepared to talk about programming <coughs> TIF projects. And the legislature had suggested that we even program a longer time frame than we typically do. And we've been having those discussions and then the pandemic, and we kind of held off on all that programming of TIF and kind of took a little more conservative approach and said, let's not, let's not program out right now. So we're in a position of, of we have programmed TIF through 2024, and it's probably time for us to program a couple of more years of it. And so that's where that's kind of where our thought process is right now. I know there's lots of discussions swirling around out there about bonding. There's lots of discussions about projects, regardless of all of those discussions going on, because for us, the governor has not said anything about bonding. So that's not something we're going to be talking about in this meeting. There are other outside discussions going on. But for us, we need to think about what we might want to do regardless. And that would be thinking about the next couple of years and using the TIF prioritization list. 
Um, there's been some, like I said, we were talking about it last programming workshop prior to, um, we were talking about how we would use the list and we've never actually programmed from it, even though we've created the process, we've worked on finessing the process and the list, we haven't programmed from it. So now that we are working towards making recommendations on programming from it, there's a couple of things that we feel like we need to talk about. Um, and one of those things is how we look at other considerations. Um, and so with that, I am going to, Ben has some slides ready and he's gonna talk through it, but we haven't done a lot of staff update while we've been virtual. And I wanna remind everybody staff update is supposed to be a little more conversational. Um, we still, everything is recorded as we just talked about, but we wanna be conversational, answer questions, talk about philosophy and approach here. And so just try to imagine that we're in a setting remote from the Wasatch Front and you're in casual clothing and comfortable and we're having a conversation trying to understand where we are. So that's kind of the visual I wanna give you. And so we'll proceed with the conversation based on that. And if you guys have questions, please stop as we go. And we will probably have senior leaders all taking bets on who can disrupt Ben and Put him off his game a little bit so um but anyway so really let any questions you have please interrupt and we'll try to answer as we go but i will let ben start into this and we'll we'll again it's a conversation so with that i'm going to turn it over to ben and let him get started thanks uh can you hear me okay yes, yes. and screen check everybody seeing the presentation okay yes yes okay so got to click on the right thing here. OK, so Terry just hit the first bullet point there perfectly. Introduction and background of what we're talking about set the stage for today. I'll just briefly mention, you know, just a little bit more detail of the purpose of the discussion. And it's to communicate that process of developing, you know, for UDOT, for us, it's developing the, the TIF funding recommendations so that we can, you know, present them in a way to the commission that, that makes sense. Uh, we started with the, you know, we start with the, the rank list that's based on the long range plan. And then, like Terry mentioned, today we're going to zoom in a little bit in there are certain situations where you may want to zoom in a little bit even further from the, the, the quality of life framework based rank list. And, and with that, that's the other consideration discussion that she talked about. So it's always important to make sure that we're within the boundaries of our statute and rule as we do th these things. So I've included a little excerpt from the administrative rule that's relevant to this discussion today. And it generally talks about the ability to use additional criteria or other considerations to establish those funding levels. And then, then the, the key point of, you know, if they, if they result in approving funding for projects that are um, over another project that has a higher prioritization rank, you do it transparently, you do it in a public meeting. And so this whole process is the intent is to do all that within the bounds of this process and rule. So we've got three examples that I think illustrate this point pretty well that we'll talk about. And under the realm of considerations that are, that are outside of the quality of life framework model, um, we've identified operational analysis in some instances that may be a, a needed step to take. We have an example of some environmental commitments that can affect the sequencing of how you would deliver a group of projects. And then there's another category where, that we've called there, 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 may, there are some projects that you know we may just need further study or evaluation on those projects. So um, I will ask, Maybe if Richard could just give a couple, Richard Brockmeyer from our planning group can just give a couple of uh, key points about like that, that concept of the, the model and the quality of life framework versus this further deeper dive. So Richard, so if you want to just give a couple of Before you do that, it looks like Commissioner Law had a question. 
Oh, yeah. Well, Sorry, it, I missed that. Sorry. Well, perhaps it's going to be explained as you provide some examples, but um, would operational analysis, let's say, um, let's say some, you know, as, as all projects are, let's say there has been some collaboration and cooperation that brings some additional funding to, a, you know, to a project that's down the list. Would that be considered something that uh, would fall into the operation analysis part or where would that fall? I think I, I don't think that it, the way that we intend that that would fall under operational analysis, but that I mean, there the the rule talks about other considerations. So I think you could, right. you know, that could be talked about as a separate other consideration potentially within the within the process. Is that okay? Terry, yeah. Terry, is that sound accurate or yeah? I think Richard's got something to add there because I think we might have it as part of one of our factors. Yeah, we, we have yeah. that as, as one of the measures within the model um, that if uh, it's basically a two qu part question, if it's part of a TRZ, it receives additional points under the uh, economic um, development sec section of the, the measures. Um, but also if there's additional funding being brought to the table as part of the project, you know, private funding, um, we, we give it an additional uh, bump and score. Richard, you have to remind us what a TRZ is. I, I'm going to the Z stand alone. I can't get away from these acronyms. I apologize. It's uh, no, that's okay. It's our job to ask. Transportation reinvestment zone. Okay, thanks. Um, and just to yeah, to add on to to Ben um, a little bit, sort of in the operational analysis. So, the the project prioritization model really is looking um, right now, especially at needs. So it's identifying needs. It's looking at you know all these various factors: economic development, mobility, um, health. Uh, connecting communities, um, but what we're not doing is getting down to the really nitty gritty operational types of analysis. So, you know, we're not doing micro simulation, for example, on, you know, what, you know, Bangor, for example, might have a need, several needs, um, but we're not getting down in the prioritization model when we have 90 plus projects to look at the micro simulation of, you know, what um, interchange might makes the most sense from an operational specific standpoint. Um, so that's the thing that, you know, in the model, uh, in prioritization on a, on a corridor level, you know, it's pretty good at identifying the need, but not the specific um, operational needs of, of how, what makes sense to, to build first. Perfect, thanks Richard. So it just so happens, that we have an example on Bangor Highway to talk about when we talk about operational analysis. So when we were discussing this one on how to think about it, you know, Bangor Highway has some characteristics and it has multiple planned projects that are in close proximity to each other that are that are changing the character of that corridor. And in this case, the Bangor Highway, it's, it's going on, it's undergoing a conversion from at grade intersections to grade separated interchanges, more of a freeway facility. So that brings some of that project specific or corridor specific um, look at, at some challenges and things that we need to look at when we're looking at those. So I've asked Grant Farnsworth, our region two planner, to give us a little bit of um, info on region two did a corridor analysis or operational analysis um, on the Bangor Highway. And um, I think one thing that he mentioned is, you know, the other thing that comes into play on this specific corridor is that there are newly constructed and under construction projects going on at the same time also that that can come into play in this analysis. So um, with that, um, before, well, let me, let me set the stage a little bit before, and I may have done this a little bit out of order, but so you're not intended to be able to read this just, just for clarity here. This is just an illustration no purpose. No colors. So the colors are there coming. Will be. I'm, I'm, there will I'm be glad colors. that you, you I'm, and that there are even, there's a color code and everything just um, because I knew that uh, you, you would want that. So perfect. So this is, this is the full um, ranked list. And then if you click here, there are colors that are added and they're orange for operational analysis of the Bangor Highway projects that are in that list that are on that corridor. So you can see there's five 
five projects that are listed, you know, somewhere within the prioritization process. And so then what I've done here is just collapsed that list to show so that you can actually read which projects those are. They're in the same relative order as they were shown in that list, but it shows all the projects that are, you know, within phase one of the long range plan and then therefore in the prioritization ranked list. So with that, Region 2 did some operational analysis on the corridor, which includes all these. So um, I'm going to turn a few minutes over to Grant Farnsworth to do a little description on what they looked at and how they did it. Thanks, Ben. So yeah, well, I just wanted to provide a, a high level overview of the operational analysis on Bangor Highway and, and some of the criteria that we use to uh, determine the sequencing. And, like Ben mentioned, one of the key considerations is that 6200 South, 104th South, and 126 South are all under construction. And so what will the traffic uh, look like when those are completed and how the bottleneck shifts and the, the behavior of travelers shift? So we wanted to capture that with travel times and speeds, um, look at safety considerations, um, and then also what will the projected volumes be on, on uh, the side streets and cross streets and the um, Bangor Highway is such a regional facility that when we do improvements on um, Bangor Highway it also affects parallel and adjacent facilities so that there can be a regional network improvement when that's completed so we wanted to evaluate that as part of this analysis as well so um, the next slide here we have um, just a high level an example of some of the performance um, criteria that we, we looked at. And so here on the right side of this graph is you have Bangor on the north end, your California Avenue and SR201. On the left side, you have Bangor Highway on the south side, like around 134th South and 27th West. And so this is just an example of the PM peak speed profile where the lines that are up near the top are represent uh, high speeds going 50 to 60 miles per hour. And as they dip down, they uh, represent a more uh, congested period of long queues uh, going zero to 10 miles per hour. So this blue line represents that condition we just talked about once 62nd, 104th and 126th are completed. You can see there's a large queue um, going southbound that backs up from 9,800 south and it's really exacerbated in, in this condition. Um, also, there's a, a long distance between 47th South and 98th South where there's no stops for any uh, intersections and then they come on to 9800 South. So that would be a surprise and, and gonna have safety implications with that. So that was an important thing to consider. And, and also 47th South is a connection to I-215 for regional traffic. So that was an important connection as well, in addition to the decreased speed. Uh, so that kind of represented why we looked at those, the sequencing first. And then we also wanted to look on the north and south. And the north intersections have to be done uh, at the same time simultaneously because their intersections are much more closely spaced than the southern segment. So when we looked at those improvements to the north, uh, there was a much bigger travel time benefit and, and other factors than the southern segment. So if you go to the next slide, um, this kind of captures why we had 9800 South and 4700 South as the first priority to be done. And then the north section was this, um, to be sequenced the ne um, next and 134th and 2700 West were the last um, sections to be done. So that's hopefully a, a high level overview of the operational analysis of Bangor Highway and the thinking that went into that. Thanks, Grant. So then if if we look back at that collapse list with respect to the, the prioritized list, we've added a column on the very right that captures that operational consideration thought from that, uh, from that study that Region 2 did. So it's kind of a just for this for this discussion today, it's just kind of a way it's like, okay, we we we've got some other things that we probably want to consider in developing any funding recommendations if we're if we're talking about the Bangor project. So I'm I'm kind of just gonna leave that there and we'll we'll tie it back in at the end of this discussion. But I just wanted to point out that that's that was the process on on Bangor to 
to capture some of those ideas and thoughts. So then next, and I'll just pause for a second, any, any questions with that operational analysis discussion or description? Okay, so let's talk about environmental commitment example where we have Mountain View Corridor. And with that, there was a environmental commitment during the EIS and the EIS that resulted in the 2008 record of decision where there was some phased implementation requirements on, on those projects. So here is just the, this is the wording. <laughs> this is the excerpt from the record of decision. And it, it talks about, you know, going from a, phase one, what they're calling in the environmental document, a phase one roadway to phase two roadway, and certain things need to be in place prior to doing that conversion. That's a lot of words, and um, I won't read them out loud, uh, word by word, but what uh, we'll try to do is the Mountain View team actually put together like a quick two-minute video that does a pretty good job of explaining this phased implementation approach. So I'm going to attempt to play that. Hopefully it works. Sometimes we've got issues here. So give me one second and we'll give this a, uh, I got to go back one. Mountain View Corridor is a planned freeway, transit and trail system in Western Salt Lake. Are you guys hearing and seeing that? Just a quick check. Okay, yes. I'll let it go. In northwestern Utah County, the corridor will eventually be a 35-mile freeway from I-80 in Salt Lake County to SR-73 in Utah County. Initial roadway construction includes two lanes in each direction with signalized intersections. 17 miles of roadway are currently open to traffic in Salt Lake County from 160th South to 4100 South in Utah County. A three-mile segment is open from Redwood Road to I-15 on 2100 North in Lehigh. Future construction will build out the remainder of the corridor by converting intersections to interchanges and adding inside lanes to achieve a fully functional freeway. The transit commitments of the project include extending light rail, tracks, the Daybreak Parkway, which is presently built and operational, and an express bus service along 5600 West in Salt Lake County. The trail system will run adjacent to the entire corridor. Mountain View Corridor follows a phased construction plan, a balanced approach designed to include roadway, transit, and trail. This phased approach was approved by UDOT, UTA, and the Federal Highway Administration with support from state and local officials and community groups. The phasing plans for Mountain View Corridor are different on the north and south sides of Old Bingham Highway. North of Old Bingham Highway, Phase one roadway includes building two lanes in each direction with intersections and service interchanges at SR-201 and I-80. Phase one transit, which consists of an express bus service on 5600 West, must be in place before phase two roadway construction starts, which converts Mountain View Corridor to a freeway system with interchanges. Once phase one transit is operational, Mountain View Corridor can convert the existing roadway into a freeway system with interchanges. South of Old Bingham Highway, Phase 1 roadway includes two lanes in each direction with intersections. Before Phase 2 roadway construction starts, Phase 1 transit, which is an express bus on 5600 West, must be in place. If Phase 1 transit is not in place, then the Phase 1 roadway segment from Porter Rockwell Boulevard to 2100 North must be in place for Phase 2 roadway construction to start. By preserving land now and building in phases, UDOT is planning for tomorrow and improving the quality of life for today's residents as well as for future generations. With Mountain View Corridor, getting there is getting better. Okay, so I totally forgot to mention that I was going to have you guys pay special attention to the end of that video when they talked about the southern portion because there may or may not be a quiz coming up here in a few slides. So it's kind of unfair now, prizes? but- Are there prizes, Ben, if we do the quiz thing? The only thing I have to offer is a virtual high five. So if, <laughs> if you'll take a virtual high five, I'll, 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 
You got it. Okay. Ben, this is Natalie. May I ask a question that might be just a little off topic, but I just want to put a pin in it for thinking about it. Sure. If I, when I see that, I'm really impressed with the degree of planning and the comprehensive nature of it and the sequencing, you know, kudos to the team for things like that. Um, when you talk about preserving land and all those sorts of things for a big investment like that, what is the status of billboards on something like that? Because it's the same thing with billboards. Once you give up the property right, you can't ever get it back. And with the term Mountain View Corridor, it strikes me as a little odd that you would have billboards blocking the view of the mountains. <laughs> Carrie, can I ask for He's help about to for lob me? a question to me, and I'm furiously <laughs> trying to think, 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 think. The, the point is that you have to think about that now, just like you have to think about the phasing and the, um, you know, the land uh, set-asides and I just didn't know if anyone's asked that question or where we're at with that. I, I do know that part of the conversation was that we would follow whatever the current law and current yeah. guidelines for the corridor, that we weren't going to try to do something different for this corridor, that we would follow our regular Nat process. I think Carlos is Natalie? chiming in. Hi, Carlos. Yeah. Can you hear me, Terry? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Hi, Natalie. Sorry, I'm driving. This is a really, really touchy subject, um, but the department does not have the ability to restrict outdoor advertising. That is a decision that local governments can implement by implementing a scenic byway. And they have, there's a process to go through to implement a scenic byway. And then that can begin that conversation about whether or not billboards are um, regulated at a different level. Okay. That's what I needed to know. Thanks so much. Okay, okay. you're welcome. Okay, so we saw the, we talked about environmental commitments. We saw the video that's got some requirements in there. So we'll do the same drill real quick here that we did on Bangor. You look at the, the ranked list for TIF Highway, and then we go forward. This shows in green for environmental commitment that of all the projects in the rank list that are subject to that phase implementation environmental commitment. And then here again, I've, we just collapsed the list to, so you can read which projects those are and they're, they're in the same relative rank order amongst themselves. But here's where the, here's where the quiz part comes into play. So after seeing the video and about the phase implementation requirement and knowing that phase one transit is not currently in revenue operation, which one of these projects would need to be built first before any projects going to environmental phase two would need to be built? And I'll, there's, there's some clues on this slide that might help, but <laughs> anybody have a, Anybody have a Robert Robert Stewart raise his hand? Any commissioners want to weigh in, or should I give it? Should I kick it over to Robert Stewart? <laughs> go go for it, Robert. The part that needs to be built is the section of Mount View between Porter Rockwell and Twenty One Hundred North. All right, I was right. Let's unveil. Let's unveil the answer virtual high five. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> so this, you know, this slide similar to the one that we talked about on Bangor over here on the very right, this captures the environmental phase that we'll want to keep in as a consideration in developing those and, and knowing that requirement that this section right here would need to be built prior to being able to build any projects that turn it into phase two. Any questions on that one? Okay, so because Mountain View Corridor isn't, you, we don't want to make it too easy that it's just an environmental commitment. <laughs> this one actually has a little bit of operational analysis layered on top of that. And it's because of the, the interaction with Mountain View Corridor, Quarry Ride Freeway and Foothill Boulevard 
So similar to Bangor, we've listed a, a concept here of, you know, we've got multiple planned projects that change the character of the corridor. And in this case, you know, on the Mountain View side, it's conversion from an arterial system to a freeway system. And then there's the aspect that there's some connection of these systems th through system to system interchanges. So that always gets interesting in trying to develop sequencing and, and things like that of these projects. So for that discussion, I'm going to turn I'm going to turn a couple minutes over to Eric Rasband, the Region Three planner. Region Three and Region Two did some operational analysis on this uh, set of projects that he's going to go through um, quickly here. So I will advance the slide and give him Eric a few minutes here. So just going back to Richard, he with, as his team developed the, the prioritization model, um, it was looking at multiple cro projects across the state. And then um, Grant also highlighted how various projects influence other projects. And that's what we were trying to answer in cooperation with uh, Region 2. And so we had that uh, environmental commitment that we needed to build the segment um, over the point from Porter Rockwell to 2100 North. And our question is, how does that project influence the overall traffic pattern? So if I look at um, Eagle Mountain, Saratoga Springs, and Lehigh in 2017, the volume or the, the population of that area is 127,000 people. It's projected to grow to 430,000 people. And that just kind of shows the need and the growth that we're experiencing. A, a fairly large number of those um, people are co currently commuting into the Salt Lake Valley for employment. Um, and so we looked at it and, and with that connection over the point of the mountain, we really saw a need for a parallel freeway to I-15 and, um, and the, the data um, started to kind of suggest that there's, there's a, a method to the madness in, in how we go forward in combining these projects. So by going with that first project, which is the environmental commitment, we get a, a really great connection over the point of the mountain. Um, it's expected to carry um, 50,000 vehicles a day, pretty much on opening day. Um, and, and then what is the next project? And the, the data was showing that because of the growth that's happening in Southwest uh, Salt Lake County, that, that segment from Porter Rockwell up to Old Bingham was probably the, the next uh, project in, in the segment. And then, uh, you know, last fall, um, just a little over a year ago in 2019, we opened up the, the Mountain View corridor segment from 2100 North down to State Route 73 at the front of Droves. Well, with all that growth, now you start to get a freeway system into the Salt Lake Valley, um, adding to that freeway system with, with that section from 2100 North down to State Route 73 or the Quarry Ride Freeway. And then um, the freeway connection um, from Quarry Ride basically over to Ranches Parkway and then you really start to have that parallel freeway system um, that grows. After you get that, there's there's a desire or the public has a need to get over to I-15, whether they're continuing north over the point of the mountain or they're going into American Fort or um, continuing south into the Provo Orem area. And that 2100 North freeway infill is a, a it, it shows that it's because of the 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 way traffic patterns are changing based on the delivery of these projects. Um, that was maybe a little lower um, in the overall need as we move forward. Um, and then just an editorial note, I drove to the south end of Saratoga Springs uh, over the weekend. And if you can picture I-15 from Lehigh Main Street down to Orem Center Street, that is the distance um, that Saratoga Springs covers. In essence, um, it's a very long linear corridor and there's a lot of growth. And, and so then the Foothill Boulevard um, corridor that we, we did a planning study with Mountain Land Association of Governments where we identified a frontage road system and a, a freeway. Um, we have really good partners in Saratoga Springs that are currently trying to build that one of those frontage road systems. And they are actively pursuing um, preser preserving over a 400 foot wide corridor for this future freeway connection. They've been really good partners in using their land use authority to preserve that um, corridor, um, even in advance of the effort that we may need to go to in the future. So it's just the analysis as we, we completed it. 
Thanks, Eric. So similar drill to what we did before. We're still talking about Mountain View and Mountain View related projects. So we've left, this is where it kind of shows a little bit of, in this instance, there's a little bit of layering. And so the, the green is still the environmental commitment stuff, but now if we layer on this operational analysis, there's, there's three additional projects on the list that come into play within this discussion. And those are highlighted in orange for operational analysis. So here again, we've collapsed the list, so it shows all those projects so you can read them and carried through the environmental phase um, notation there on the right side. And then if you, you know, the, the thing that Eric showed now, if we were to take this implementation recommendation out of the operational analysis and then apply it back to the, um, that list, we've got an operational consideration that we can also layer on top of this. And so this was the, the, the order based on that implementation recommendation that we can keep as a consideration as we move forward. So that's the kind of the environmental commitment and operational analysis example in, for this specific case. The, the last category of the three that we, that we mentioned is what we call further study or evaluation needed. And there's a couple, there's a couple projects, a uh, couple project concepts that are in the, the rank list where the thought is that there's further study or evaluation needed. Uh, managed motorways and Logan Main Street for a couple different reasons. Uh, the managed motorways has a little bit to do with um, some further study needed on some technology that, that that is involved in that and then the logan main street and then anybody else can jump in if they would like but it's it's related to studying and developing the appropriate scope in that location prior to recommending any implementation funding on that project so for this category same same drill start with the list highlight in red some of the ones where there's further study or evaluation needed and then collapse the list so it shows which ones those are. The, the managed motorways is, all, is, is broken up into two projects because it's um, between two jurisdictional areas, or, or I don't know if that's the appropriate term, but it's, I think it's region two, region three for us and uh, different MPOs, I believe, on those ones. So those ones are just considerations of, you know, further study or evaluation needed prior to recommending full implementation type funding. So now here's the, the part where I'm hoping that um, we can bring it all together and make it make sense and kind of show that there's logic and thought behind all of this. So let's go through a, an example funding recommendation scenario. And this is where Terry helped me if I, if I need it here. But as Terry talked about before, let's say that we are going to look to recommend funding through 2026. That would be approximately, based on current revenue projections, about an additional $1 billion to $1.2 billion in the TIF area. So that'd be kind of the, the, the ballpark of the money that you'd be working with. And then I just noted a, a bullet point here that I'll, I'll kind of highlight a little bit here in the next slide of, you know, we, we would want to use, make sure that we use updated cost estimates where appropriate. The numbers that are in the prioritization are the 2019 long range plan numbers. Sometimes they're they're a accurate number, but we always, you know, look for opportunities to make sure we've got a, a good number. So I just wanted ben, to ben, bring that up. Ben, yep. I might just make add to the um, if you look at the billion to 1.2 billion for TIF that we're saying potentially could be programmed. The reason the number is not higher, um, we we have typically 750 to 800 million um, coming in in TIF in those years, but we are still paying back bonds. So we don't have all of that money available to us to program. So that's why the number, we kind of just used a rough number of one to 1 1.2, because again, there's still those bonds we have to be making that takes part of that revenue in 25 and 26. Cause we are on, we've typically done 15 year bonds. So we're still paying off a number of those. Okay, this is where I, I hope this all makes sense here because this is the culmination. So this slide just 
it's an example funding recommendation scenario. It's not, it's not to, in, to be construed as any kind of <laughs> recommendation at this point. But what it, what we did is we just showed the top ten projects off of the prioritization list, and we carried with them any of the color coding, if whatever you want to call it, that we that we work through now. So if there was color coding that was applicable to those projects, we've included that there so that that would key us in that there might be some other considerations. And if you, for the first, uh, I guess I, I better explain a couple things. So this column over here, for example, funding recommendation, that would be where um, the number would be that we would end up, you know, that would be where you would see a recommendation for funding for that specific project. Um, and then this column on the right starts to calculate the cumulative funding as you go down. So like this 504 is just the, the 200 from here plus the, the 304 in this column. So just to orient how this works. So if we were just starting to look down at this list and if we were to take that other consideration with the top project, further study or evaluation needed, maybe not recommend funding for that project. Then you move down to the second project. There wasn't any other considerations that we discussed that it's not got any highlights. It doesn't have any highlights, um, but this shows an example of where maybe there's an updated cost estimate. So the, the original number was 170. Now it's 200 after taking a closer look um, at that one. So that's why that 200 is there. So now here's where I hope that this makes sense. We get down to the third project and it's got the other consideration. That 304 listed there might be a place to recommend the project that came out of the environmental commitment in place and help me Terry to use the right terminology here, having a showing recommended funding in place of that project for that project that um, had the environmental commitment to be built prior to any phase two project. Mm -hmm. Right, so maybe I'll let everybody let that sink in a little bit. So instead of funding the 2100 North Freeway, which we we can't build first because of the environmental commitments, instead of funding that one, we would say in place of that, fund the one that we're allowed to do with the environmental commitment. So this is kind of a big philosophy here. Uh, just wanted to make sure everybody's capturing that that we would fund a different project in place of the 2100 North Freeway because of the environmental consideration. Right. Yeah, it's just trying to tie that logic back for all the stuff that we talked about on how to get to here. Hey, Terry. Yes. It was interesting, and Carlos can speak to this, but he didn't get very many questions. But one of the questions that came up in his committee hearing was, how do you how do we balance between the, the priority process and political realities right carlos and that was one of the questions and of course he he, I, he shared it masterfully that put it back on the commission that we have a process where we actually you know weigh these things out but then have to justify if we move things around that are outside of the pro priorities that you're showing us here so this is a this is something that came up in the committee the other day how do we how do we deal with political input or political issues and realities right carlos and i think that's how they the question came up to you and I thought that was interesting. They're looking at that and asking, how are you going to deal with that if it's a political issue that's outside of your priority process that we're, we're, we're looking at right now? And and Jim, a lot of people look at the word political and may think of that's a inappropriate or a dirty way of doing things. But when I hear, hear the word political, I look at it as that's an avenue for information to be delivered and it can be considered in the other considerations. Yeah. Because you know, our politicians have access to our citizens that I think we as a state agency probably envy. Um, now, whether or not our elected officials agree with that all the time or not is, is up for debate. But, um, you know, they, they hear and know things that, um, you know, we need to know. And so that balance point between gathering all that information is, um, I think, really important as part of this decision making process. I agree. I just thought that was interesting that came up. One of the few committee questions that came up in the committee the other day was about this whole process. Yeah, it was really that, you know, in terms of substance, it just maybe 
dive off in another direction, but um, it was that, and it was also how, what, what role does kind of private participation play in this decision-making? And yeah, the senator right. was, was primarily going towards, I think we've talked about with commission that project north of Vernal on 191, mm -hmm. where the uh, uh, Rob, Rob R3, R3, uh, what's the name of that company up there? Simplot. Simplot, thank you. Yeah, where they're, where they're doing their work. Yeah. So anyway, just the questions that came up dealt with the, the prioritization process. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the test as we were discussing this is if we go back to that rule wording about, you know, identifying reasons for a change, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, what we walk through here, the logic, that would be something that would be fairly easy to demonstrate the reasons for the change and there would be a, you'd be able to show that reason for it. So I think that's the goal of this, this discussion, that it's not just, ah, oh, we want to swap this project for this project. It's like we went through a process of looking into things and, and thoughtful and evaluating. So, okay, so then if we keep stepping down through the list, there's a, there's a, there's a further study or evaluation needed on that other project. Then at number five, there's uh, maybe an updated cost estimate on that project. And you know you can see out here on the right that the cumulative number is rising up a little bit. And then we get into another highlight. And so that one would be another example of an area where you could show a reason for doing the project that came out of the operational analysis in place of the, the project that is shown here. And so that's, that's what that potentially could represent is that dollar amount is that those two projects that were listed, if you remember back on grant graphic of, that had the number one and our, our consideration on them. So that would be what this would represent. And then um, you keep working down and you'll notice that it's, okay, we talked about one, one to 1 1.2 billion, like you, that's about where you get on the list before you start bumping up against that, that uh, available money. So this just kind of shows the thought, the philosophy behind developing these funding recommendations that, that would be then discussed and presented. And then I, I guess I did just to, because I did list the top 10 here, even though it's a total of what, 3 billion, just to make it clear that, I know this looks confusing because it's kind of crisscrossing, but that project that was at number six, that is represented here because that was actually the number two out of the, the Bangator operational analysis. So that's, that's one way that that could be looked at too here. Um, in place of that, but I, I don't want to confuse that too much because the, the main point was to show this philosophy and how the, the funding would potentially look. So, Terry, is there anything with this example that we could talk talk about? I, I think maybe that that it it takes walking it all the way through to the end to figure out what your question might have been at the beginning. So if there are questions, it might, this might help you ask questions about some of the stuff we talked about earlier. So I would say um, any, any question you have about anything been presented, we can go back and forth through the slides. And this really is a philosophy approach that we're trying to put in front of you, but we would likely have um, a recommended funding scenario we put in front of you in March during the programming workshop. And so this is just push back on the philosophy here because we're just trying to propose what we think would, is a reasonable philosophy based on combination of the data that we could capture in the prioritization process, plus that additional operational analysis that as Richard said, is it, it's a really fine level of detail that we can't run for the whole program. We really have to do it for, um, for on a limited basis. And we feel like these two projects, these two corridors, Bangor and Mountain View, are really the only ones we're looking at where we're changing it from an at-grade facility with signalized intersections where you're transitioning it to a three-way system. That takes 
that takes extra analysis to make sure we do that in the right order. So it's really only those two corridors we're trying to do that with. So that's our philosophy. And I guess I'll stop talking and let you guys um, ask questions though, but, but kind of poke back on us at the philosophy and um, see if it sticks. <laughs> Um, Terry, I think that was my question was how did you determine which projects you wanted to go back in and look at for operational analysis? And so you were looking at those two um, primary corridors as the way are there other are there uh, now that those have kind of achieved analysis, are there other projects that you're also looking at to see if because let's look at this, it feels like there's some um, synergy by putting the whole project together instead of having parts and pieces spread all over. Um, are, there other, are there other things that you anticipate looking at down the road? Is down the road a bad thing to say in transportation? <laughs> down the train or down the, uh, the bus? Um, we, hadn't, we hadn't anticipated anything else that we'd look at as a corridor. We did um, at one point talk about, should we look at I-15 that way? But I think the project we've identified on I-15, it's already a freeway and they wouldn't changing or doing implementing one of the projects on I-15 didn't seem to us as if it was going to have as much disruption as these one as the projects where we're we're transitioning from signalized intersections to interchanges. That to us was a was kind of a big leap and that really affected the operations of it. So we didn't foresee any others, but if there's something else that you guys think makes sense to look at, we certainly can. Uh, Terry, this is Lou. Can you hear me with my microphone? Yes. Uh, this was very, very useful, and I appreciate the clarity with which Ben and others shared it. Uh, what I'm concerned about from a business standpoint, these are really big dollars, and uh, you know, three billion here, three billion there, it starts to add up. But, uh, I just wonder if we're talking apples and oranges, given the rise in construction costs and the, the late expenses of time and all that. Is I, I know we talked a little bit about that, but given the the huge amounts involved, uh, I just wonder how quickly or how appropriately we can say, hey, we should not delay any longer because expenses are going up at 10 or 12 percent a year or whatever they might be. So that's an added, uh, you know. It, who knows what that's going to be, but that just seems to me to put some urgency to make sure that that this kind of process is done correctly. And, and I think it's done very well. I this really made sense to me, which is a low bar, you know. If you can get me to understand, I think anybody could. But I, anyway, I might see if I can get Lisa to chime in because I think she might have some numbers on historically or what we've been the last year on inflation rates for construction. Yeah, Lisa, can I put you on the spot? And do you have those off the? Sure. And Chris can jump in if I say something wrong. Um, so through the first three quarters of last year, our increase was around 3%. Um, we're still working on getting the total year end numbers for 2020, but that's what we saw. And these estimates, I'm not sure what um, year been showing, but the regions all did go through and update it based on the current costs that they've been speaking, so. That's a little bit more, uh, yeah, that's more helpful than what I was fearing. And in our commercial real estate world, we're seeing, you know, construction costs of, you know, residential well, others go up quite a bit more dramatically. But that's Lisa, the, Lisa, why you, Lisa, why don't you share the, I think you have three and five year numbers, maybe 10 year numbers. Yeah, so over the last five years, costs have gone up 30%. And over the last 10, it's been around 54. So we have seen some pretty substantial oh. increases. And Chris looks like he has something to add. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just here in case you wanted to ask more questions about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say anytime uh, Commissioner Gartner's on the phone, I hate to talk about these kind of numbers because she, she knows them a lot better than we do. But that's <laughs> <laughs> on any topic. On any I topic. Have you, yeah. I have you completely fooled. <laughs> So, so these these numbers, when these percentages are what we refer to as con construction cost based on a construction cost index. So it's using not every commodity, but it's using the major commodities that are bid on our jobs, basically the major cost drivers of our jobs, and it's um, using that to come up with these indexes. And 
you know, we, we look at indexes that are done at a national level. We look at them at the state level. We also look regionally to see what's going on regionally because those, those vary as well. So, you know, and, you know, your, Will, your comment on timing of projects is really important because a lot of times we're looking at just the cost side of things. And, um, you know, I know how important money is and you look at, well, construction costs increases are going up. But, you know, we have our, you know, our price of money is down here. You know, you pay, if you bond, you pay interest payments and where do those lines intersect. But what we don't sometimes take into account in this calculus is the benefit of the project. And, you know, that's a difficult one to quantify. But, you know, I like to say that if a project's worth doing, it's worth delivering as fast as possible to the public um, because there's safety benefits. You know, every job we do is a safety job where, you know, we're designing these to reduce crashes, hopefully save lives. But there's also mobility benefits associated with that as well. And so you know, quantifying those in that equation, Lou, is it's a little complex. And you start looking at different time frames because a lot of those benefits are accumulated over a 30 year period. How do you amortize that and bring that back to a common, you know, analysis time frame? All of those things make it a little more complicated to just use pure quantitative analysis. Well, and that's very helpful. I tell my my friends who are not very sophisticated about this, you have no idea how much work you dot that puts into ensuring that every aspect of this is is reviewed appropriately. I, I have heard, and this was Natalie, I think he maybe hosted it at the Governor's Economic Summit about uh, Speaker Wilson talked about bonding in this environment and one time money in this environment and infrastructure is a key component of all this. And if you build it, they'll come kind of uh, discussion. So it, this is highly timely and I appreciate the uh, quite a bit of work and a uh, great deal of sophistication has gone in this presentation. So thank you. And, you know, and maybe you know if that I I'm sorry, go ahead, Terry. I was going to say, if I could just add, there's a there's a subtlety to this that's hard to capture. We can talk about historic construction costs and them going up or down sometimes, occasionally. But I think one thing we have to be careful of is if we flood the market with so many projects that we don't have the competition we need, competition drives the price a lot as well. And so we yeah. just want to be, that, that's not the main variable, but we just want to make sure we're keeping in mind, we don't want to flood the market all at once and not have enough competition to get the prices. Cause we do rely a lot on competition to get good prices. So just kind of, that's another factor out there. Well said, yeah, very helpful. Yeah, and so it's I, a, it's infrastructure conversation. It's taking place at the state level. You know, there's some one-time money, there's uh, talk of bonding, but there's a very, you know, there's a lot of excitement at the national level as well right now on looking at the reauthorizing bill as well as looking at an infrastructure bill. And, you know, it's gonna have a different flavor with the new administration, um, but it's gonna be a, uh, there's gonna be a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces in the next six months. I have one question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, please. Uh, so I'm assuming the example that we went through and reviewed is the number one items for the state on all of the plan. So this that we're talking about, there isn't anything in northern Utah or southern Utah that would bypass, that would supersede the ones that we've looked at, or is that still part of the process? Terry? Hey. Uh, that's a great question, and I think that's something we, we wanted to talk about this philosophy of other considerations, and I don't know, Ben, what we call this one, but we did we did produce a list that has the, the urbanized area represented by, we call it the MPO list, and we have the, the non-MPO list, basically the non-urban area. We have those two lists, and it's likely we would do some kind of recommendation based on the, both lists. We wanna recognize that the rural area is important. We've always seen it as important for the state. And so we created two separate lists because Richard struggled. We tried to get him to help us compare urban and rural and get the magic formula that could help tell us which one we should fund. And finally, we said, we're better off just to have two lists and recognize that we need to fund in both areas so that we, we can put two lists in front of you and then make recommendations um, based on rural versus urban investment. So 
Terry, can Ben maybe show on the commission site where those, I don't know if you did that already. So I was just on the phone earlier. Ben can do just about anything. Well, <laughs> ben, go live. Go to the u.utah.gov. I'm going to jinx you, him now. Okay, I'm going to go back to U dot the main page. Are, are you guys seeing that? Okay. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Go back to the main page. Um, this is the way I get there. So if anybody else gets there differently, <clears throat> I always go to Transportation Commission. There's probably multiple places, multiple ways. And then prioritization process. And then we're, we're probably going to do some reorganization of this page. But if yes. you look right now, we have we kind of culminated last March with our, our, all our rank list. This first link that I'm not going to click on, that's the, the tip highway list. That's every project. And then we broke that up into two filtered views. This is what Terry was just mentioning. So one is um, MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization filter, which represents the urban areas, and then a non-MPO filter. So if I click on that non-MPO filtered list, that would be just a subset of projects that are the intent is to represent the urban area. So they oh. still retain oh, their oh. relative ranking. Or, sorry, bro. Yeah. <laughs> driving and talking, driving the mouse and talking at the same time. Didn't catch that. So represents oh. the rural area. Um, they still maintain their relative ranking, but now it's the, the urban projects are filtered out. So it gives an opportunity to look at like what's the highest What's the highest ranking rural type project? So this can be used to develop, you know, the intent was this would be used to develop funding recommendations and funding approvals also. You know, knowing that uh, the governor obviously has a lot of focus on rural as well now in the state, I'm sure this will get some play perhaps more than even in the past. Not that it didn't, but I'm, I'm sure Carlos, uh, you know, knowing you know, some focus <laughs> of rural Utah this is to be a list that'll be looked at. I think some more. Yeah, he's obviously interested in the in the rural Utah, and you know, and we have been as well. I think yeah, you know, we historically, have been. The, historically, the commission has always tried to find a balance. Um, it's amazing, you know, rural Utah, a you know, I'll just make up a number, a ten million dollar passing lane project for rural Utah is is like gold. Um, Compared to you know in an urban area, you might have to you know get to a hundred million dollars to do something that makes that much of a noticeable difference for the public. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just one more thing to add in terms of what Ben showed and prices on projects. We mostly tried to stick with long range plan numbers, and I think. As Lisa said, or some someone said, we have the regions have updated those numbers. That's something that we would be putting together for March. We would make sure that we had the right inflation number to make sure that we, when we program for 25 or 26, that we've got the right number in there. Ben was trying to show kind of for example. Um, so those are things that we would update between now and March when we put more of a list in front of you. Any other questions on on process or philosophy or specific projects? Okay, well if if there's we you can interrupt at any point in the rest of the meeting, but maybe we shall transition Ben to the active transportation discussion. I'd just like to say Terry and Carlos, thanks for all your work. I mean, this really makes sense. And I think the pushback from the legislature is, is we want to make sure that we're doing things in a organized manner, that we're doing the things that are important first uh -huh. and then filling in. And, and I think you're, this is a great job. This is a great discussion. Thanks, Cone. Okay, so Ben has up here the 
we have changed our approach a little bit. Um, and I think we talked about this. Ben, do you remember which meeting we talked about it? We, we, okay, I'm putting him on the spot and he won't answer. <laughs> no high five if you can't answer it. Um, it, was so in a, it was in a commission, it was in a commission, a commission meeting. So, yeah. <laughs> so we, had a, we had a discussion <laughs> about active transportation and we, we had discussed changing our approach in getting the nominated list and that we wanted to be able to represent what more regional needs were and be able to represent some of those bigger projects that were important to us as a region. And so we have also as part of the rule, we were supposed to have an approved active transportation plan. We now have a process that we're going to follow to have an approved plan. What we're gonna show you today is our draft plan. Our next steps with it, it will go in front of our technical team so that they are, they are fully aware of it. And then it goes to Carlos for his signature. And then that gives us an approved active transportation plan. But within the plan, we have a layer, a subset that are the regionally important projects. And this has been coordinated. Andrea has had her staff, um, Heidi and Stephanie have worked with all the MPOs. They've worked with all the regions, trying to get the projects that we think most represent a big higher regional need that helps us connect together miles and miles of trail systems. So this is, Carlos will sometimes call this, if I can put words in his mouth, is he'll call it kind of the bike freeway or the active transportation freeway? How do we make sure we're looking at the really big visionary projects and not just funding the smaller pieces? We wanna make sure things connect together in a logical way and we're, and we're also putting focus on what's really important. So we have a list of projects here that have been developed, we believe collaboratively, that we think should represent a starting list for prioritization and that we start with that list and then any projects that get nominated also get added to that list and then that whole list would be ranked. So what we wanted to show you, and Ben, I don't know, I'm kind of, um, maybe I'm dumping all over the place on you. No, that if was good, yeah. You want to jump to a map and I'll invite Andrea to jump in on this discussion as well. If I, misspoke or you want to have something you want to add to that discussion, Andrea? No, I, I think that was a, a great summary of it, Terry. I guess there are a couple things I would like to add um, just to give some context of what this map that you're looking at in this list, what they are, and maybe even more importantly, what they are not. Um, first of all, they are drafts. You know, we, we expect and intend for changes to be made to this list. Um, and this is like Terry said, this is um, kind of the view from the region level of what they what they think are important projects uh, from an active transportation standpoint. And then I think one thing that can get overlooked in this is that, um, you know, this, I think, gives some valuable information to local governments in terms of, you know, what UDOT sees as important, uh, regionally important routes and in addition, how those how those different projects would rank. Um, one of my fears is that we scare local governments off from nominating projects because that 40% match is, you know, a high hurdle to get over. And so I think being able to rank these projects without any uh, commitment uh, of a match from a local government is going to be very informative for the local government. Um, you know, what this is not is this is not a ranked list that you're looking at right now. This is not a recommendation um, for funding or anything like that. And again, um, you know, this does not imply any commitment of match on the local government part. So I'll just point out a couple of things. I zoomed in here to the St. George Southern area. Um, this right here is showing, like I've got clipped, I can scroll up here. This is that regionally important layer that Terry mentioned. So this is the project in that area. So those are the ones that would be automatically included in the, in the prioritization process and ranked. Like everybody mentioned, before they were, before you, we could fund them or before they could be funded, 
there would have to be the match requirement that they would be they would be ranked regardless. Um, so then I'm just gonna unclick that in this area and then show, you know, the other requirement is for a local government to nominate a project, it needs to be a part of a department approved plan. So I so the layer I've clicked here, this is more of a compilation of all the that the planning group did of all the local plans and and the stuff that UDOT has been working with. So this kind of sets the table for Hey, this, there's a broad um, range of projects or a broad opportunity of projects that could be nominated and meet that criteria of being on the, the approved plan. So th I kind of think of that as the base layer and then, um, you know, for uh, available for nomination. And then the other one is uh, regionally important that are automatically going to be included in the ranking. So just to orient how that how this works. So Ben, we're do we have this posted right now on the website, or will we shortly after? It's on the website. Yes. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so right here for temporarily, um, like I said, we'll probably do some better organization of this. This is kind of a uh, make sure that we're we're it's there and available for now. But right now it's listed under the January 2021 Commission staff update meeting materials, both the map and then I'll click on this one, which is just a list view um, of those regionally important projects with some additional details. It, like Andrew mentioned, draft list, still mm -hmm. some work that needs to be done on this. Um, anything else you want to add to that, Andrea, on this? Uh, okay. No, I, I don't think so. Like, yeah, I think just to reiterate that it is draft that, you know, we are continually vetting this with um, local governments and, and our MPO partners and, and you know, you, so you may see changes to this. So I do maybe just a clarification, Andrea, it probably once Carlos approves it because we need to have an approved AT plan. I think according to the rule, you will see it go from draft to approved, but I think the yeah, point you're right. trying to make is we're open to changing it, but now we have a process where it would it actually has an official sign off so that we all are talking about the same plan. But yeah, it, right. yeah that, that's a good point. And you know we're working through an amendment process because you know local governments are going to change their AT plans and we want to make sure we capture the most up to date. So it, yes, draft for now it will be approved and not draft anymore, but there will be an amendment, the ability to amend. And since nobody's jumping in really quickly with questions and we're getting towards the end of the time we said we would have together, I'm just, um, our, our plan moving forward is we're coming up on programming workshop. And so it's likely that we will have staff update meetings, February, March, and April, even though we haven't for quite a while, we think we're gonna need that time um, to be able to give you all the content you need to be able to make recommendations for you guys to, to I guess you would approve the funding for us to do the programming. So we want to make sure you have all that information. We're looking towards February staff update would likely be um, region reports and hopefully region directors have heard this and this isn't a surprise, um, but we would have the region directors report in February and then in March we would have numbers from Becky and we would start to layer that together with proposals of projects um, and then in April we would have approval of some of the program items and then May we come back for the project level approval so that's just kind of the layout of what happens with this um, information next so just kind of wanted to give you a sense of where that's where that's headed and see if anybody has any questions on that. You guys are easy today. <laughs> if, if you're gonna leave it at that, then I'm gonna just pass this off to Carlos. And see easy, if, Terry. Yeah, <laughs> two minutes. Wait till tomorrow, Terry. <laughs> Great. Easy, Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for all you've done. This this was this is a lot. Um, I think it was important for us to 
kind of talk through the logic. We really need the commissioners to kind of push back or say, you know, wait a minute, that doesn't pass the red face test. Or, yeah, I think you guys are, you know, it's making sense. And so that's really what we, you know, we, we hope you'll, you'll do that if you see it, uh, not just because it's fun. Um, but <laughs> this, uh, I think this active transportation list is, is important to get out there. You know, we really wanted to show it to the commission first, this regionally significant one, or I've been referring to it as the interstate of trails, um, because there's local governments and, and department, we've done all great jobs of building trails, but this idea of connecting them and creating a network or a system of trails is really, I think, a really our next step. And it's our really our biggest opportunity. So um, the planning team's done a great job working with their partners to try to put something together. Um, and I think once it's out there, it gives people something to kind of look at and, you know, acknowledge, um, yeah, that's something I want to get behind. And uh, so I'm excited about that. But commissioners, any questions on anything we talked about or on any other subject you'd like to bring up? Covered a ton. It was great. And I know everybody that has a bike, I wish there were three times as many as they had it. 11 months ago, I'm going to be grateful for this because I still remember when we were down in uh, Moab that time and went with the electric bikes. I mean, those kind of things, you know, really drive home the point. So many thanks. Yeah, we met with um, Lisa, Terry, and I met. We meet every quarter with uh, Bike Utah, so one of our partners, and you know they they are so excited about how the electric bike is changing, creating more accessibility for people to use bikes in places of cars and she spoke on um how she has a two-year-old and it's the same amount of time now with her electric bike to get to the daycare and she lives in lehigh as it is for her to jump in the car and so she showed us she was very proudly showing us her uh, her urban mobile mobility uh, electric bike that she's using around the Lehigh area. And so I think electric bikes are gonna change and increase the amount of people that are using active transportation. Uh, Carlos, I echo that. I've put over 4,000 miles on my e-bike. Uh, and when I really became a believer was I was in Tel Aviv and it's maybe two, three years ago, but I saw them coming by me and I <sighs> went, whoa, this is big. You know, if we're when we get together, I'll show a video I took standing on the street in Copenhagen a couple of years ago. And it was harder to cross the bike lanes than the car the lanes with cars because and the shape variety of bikes that people had. You know, you had the carpenters with trailers behind their bikes, you had the plumbers, you had the moms with three kids. It was unbelievable. So I'll show you guys that video. It's pretty fun. <laughs> And I also want to congratulate the leadership that allows that when somebody like Jason abandons ship, that we have such a great uh, bench to fill. This is exciting to see the development that allows that kind of evolving uh, uh, turnover to take place. So thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, we're we're very lucky. Anything else, Nagi? Are, are we? We're just getting all these digested until tomorrow, and then we're going to find out if there's a question to ask. Tomorrow will be the day. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll excuse myself now for tomorrow. I, uh, we have our IGG uh, Appropriations Committee meeting, and uh, we'll be presenting the governor's uh, budget request, a portion of the governor's budget request. These are the basically the, uh, the transfers within line items. So within the transportation fund, and then February 5th, we'll be um, talking about the governor's um, budget requests that were from the general fund. And, um, you know, he had some pretty, some pretty big old ideas. Yeah. And uh, so we'll be uh, talking about those. So Terry will be on the commission. And so will Lisa. And uh, I'll uh, hopefully be able to survive without their help up at the legislature. <laughs> You will be, Carlos. Our prayers will be with you. Thank you. With any, that, yeah, any questions from Terry, Ben, Carlos, Andrea, anyone? anyone? No, great, great presentation. Thank you. Okay. And commissioners, if you'd like to have a sit down with any of Ben or Ben's team to just kind of poke at individual projects, to push on things, to better understand, 
don't hesitate to ask. I know they'd love to do that. Yes. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Carlos. Have a great, great afternoon, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Terry, for a good session. Thank you, commissioners. See you tomorrow, 8.30. 8.30. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ties on. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you do. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Except for Donna. All right. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.